Holy smokes, my friends. Check it out. I just got off the air with Brendan Hufford, a man of many talents, humble disposition, and great wisdom. In this episode, we set out to talk about SEO for photographers, and we do. But we also covered a lot of other topics that I think you will enjoy. For example, as a photographer, should you do work for free, or will you die from exposure? Brennan has spent an enormous amount of time helping photographers through his website, Photo MBA. And when it comes to SEO, Brennan uses a simple approach and sets out to demystify the practice altogether. Hey, I also wanted to give you an update. Several episodes ago, I invited you to rate this podcast and leave a review on iTunes. Well, the deadline of August 1st has come, and I'm about to announce the two lucky winners of the Amazon gift cards. Now listen, I loved reading all of your feedback. You all are so kind, and I just want to say thank you. If you haven't left a rating and review, you can still do so. I may not be giving away anything, but I will give you a digital high five. Now, the lucky winners are Brian Lima and Melissa McClure. If this is you, look for that Amazon gift card in your inbox here shortly. Thank you so much. Now, enjoy the show. Brendan, thank you so much for being with me today. How are you? I'm awesome. Really excited to be chatting with you. Cool. Me too, man. Well, give me, give the people a snapshot. Who are you? What do you do for work? And what do you like to do for fun? Oh man, so much. Uh, actually, no, nothing. I, I'm very, I'm extremely simple. Uh, my wife likes to joke that I'm such an uncomplicated person that it's kind of like, I, I do a couple things and I, I do them very intently. Uh, so mm. I, Graduated from college, uh, and like any young buck, I did what I chose uh, freshman year because apparently 18-year-olds should be able to decide what they want to do for the next 60 years of their lives. Right? Uh, Terrible. Why do we (laughs) let them choose? It's always wrong. Um, So I decided to be a teacher, and while I was teaching, I got a little bit frustrated. Uh, You know, in the the first couple of years, it was hard uh, not to teach, just to deal with the bureaucracy. I love teaching. Mm -hmm. And... I built a couple websites and one of them was for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And one day some guy sent me a product and said, Hey, if you uh, will write about this on your website, you can keep these shorts. And I was like, Oh, so that's a thing. And this is before <laughs> like influencer marketing was big. Yeah. And you see it on Instagram a lot now, but uh, so that happened. And then I started my own kind of uh, apparel review website. People were sending me tons of stuff. I was like, why are they making all this money? I'm creative. I want to do it too. So I started my own uh, jiu-jitsu apparel company. And then about a year ago, I was like, this isn't fun. Uh, it's not going to make enough money for me to quit teaching. Mm-hmm. So I needed to leverage the skills that I have and the social, I mean, it's so buzzwordy, but the social capital that I had, the relationships that I had and do something else. So I sold my jiu-jitsu company. I sold the, uh, kind of adjoining jiu-jitsu website, the gear review website, And I was just looking to kind of help some friends, just kind of figure out what was going on. And I had a couple friends that were photographers and I had helped them on and off with marketing in the past. One of the things I know is super true is especially if you're a full-time photographer, you, you don't have a lot of time to do marketing. You're so busy in your craft and with your clients that you don't have time to write, to do all of these other things that we're going to kind of talk about today. Mm Mm-hmm. So and I advise this. I think this is a great method for anybody who serves clients, uh, whether you do SEO like I do, or if you're a photographer, is to do really, really good work for free. Build that portfolio, in my case, build those case studies, and mm-hmm. then market that stuff, market that mm-hmm. work that you did for free. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that. I helped a couple of photographers for free. I marketed those case studies. And now uh, I do client SEO for photography. I think about two thirds of my clients are photographers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have other companies and friends that uh, I work with just because now they know I do it uh, as a profession. Um, they wanted to hire me as well. On top of that, I did quit teaching uh, about a month ago. Actually, I didn't quit. I just decided not to return next year. Yeah. And right. You, like you quit over the summer. <laughs> um, you're still getting paid out for the year. So I'm definitely not quitting. And I took a position as an SEO specialist at a very, very good uh, design agency here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So I serve kind of big brand clients. And then I have my own kind of private clients as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to, I can't wait to jump into this topic of SEO for photographers, but you bring up a really, really, um, hot topic and that is doing work for free. 
uh, you know, among all the photographer groups and photographer friends that I have on social media that I chat with, that's one of those hot topics that comes up a lot is, um, you know, people asking you to do work for exposure and people you'd ask people mm. asking you to do work for basically nothing. Um, how do you draw the line between, uh, you know, being selective and, and, and finding a strategic job that you can do for free and just being taken advantage of? So I believe in being who you want to be and then kind of stepping into that role. So I, from day one, I treated myself as a successful SEO agency Mm -hmm. and clients who are not like, I had one client that was like, Hey, uh, got your proposal. Uh, can we have 20% off? Wow. I said, no, he's like, well, we want 20, we want 20% off. And I said, well, what does I said, fine, like, here's a reduction in services, just like as a photographer, you want to pay less, like, here's a smaller package, like I offer this, and you think you're being helpful. He's like, No, 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 I want all the services. I just want that that price you gave us, just make it less. Wow. And I was like, (laughs) immediately, I was like, you know what, this isn't going to work. Yeah, Uh, I don't want your business, you know, and you handle it really professionally. Sure. Um, I have never worked for free for a person who has asked me to work for free. Mm, Interesting. The only people I I do a lot of free work uh, and I do a lot for exposure. In fact, right before this, I was on a Google Hangout uh, live broadcast on YouTube with a guy that I look up to a lot named Justin Jackson. Uh, He does a lot for digital products and uh, software as a SaaS startups and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, I was really, really just trying to provide a ton of value to him and to his audience. And I've talked to Justin forever online but that was free and it was an hour of my time. That's extremely valuable. Sure. And I sought that out. I have been emailing him trying to just provide value and be helpful and all of these things. Why? Because I want to, I like, he's a good person. He and I have a lot in common. He does great work. Mm-hmm. I want that relationship. I don't know what's going to happen because of it. I don't have an ask. I don't, I don't even know what if, you know, I hope to just have a good friend mm-hmm. uh, out of it. And I think if you're a photographer, being intentional about who you do free work for really mm-hmm. matters. Like, let's say you do free work, you do uh, photography work for, I don't know, like a giant corporation. Let's say you do a, a round of corporate headshots for a huge consulting firm like KPMG, um, global multi-billion dollar consulting firm. Well, mm-hmm. now when somebody go when the friend of the CEO goes to the website and they're like, dude, who did your headshots? That was really mm. good. He'll say, Oh, it was Brendan. Um, right. I'll give you his email. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden you have a $10,000 corporate headshot gig off of yeah. free work that you sought out. So I would, anybody who ever says like, Hey, can you come over and just do this for free? It'll be exposure. It'll be for your portfolio. Absolutely sure. not. That's already t- yeah. like, uh, honestly, like, I have one of my, like I told you, one of my best friends, uh, his name's Shane Clemenson. Uh, my entire house is filled. Literally every photo in my house is taken by him of my family, <laughs> my wife, my kids, whether mm-hmm. it's newborn family, everything. The only thing that's not is our wedding photos, but that's cause I didn't know him back then. Cause sure. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> like we got married eight years ago. So everything, but also all of those photos are paid for. Mm-hmm. Full price. Mm-hmm. He's tried to tell me a couple times not to pay him. I don't accept that. Yeah. Uh, if I really respect him as a professional, I will pay him. Now, I did all of his SEO for free because I sought that out. I wanted the exposure. Sure. So, that's cool. I I have a friend, uh, an acquaintance in the industry who I know that uh, does a lot of swaps with other businesses. I think, mm. for example, like with a vet clinic, a veterinary clinic, um, they do headshots for the clinic and do their photography so that they can post on social media and whatever, and they get a break on their vet bill. Um, I think there was also a, a gig where they did uh, an aerial yoga studio. And so they were able to swap for um, services, which was kind of a cool thing because those are things that the photographer wanted, you know, that was, those were things that, uh, they were after and, and seeking already. And so, um, mm. there was a, a kind of a barter system there that worked for both and was a win for both. Do you think those are okay scenarios too? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Especially for something that's expensive, like, uh, jujitsu, 
a hundred to two hundred dollars a month. CrossFit, right. hundred to two hundred dollars a month. Well, I know that CrossFit thrives uh, and Jiu-Jitsu thrive on social media. They thrive on Instagram. If I can give them some video and if I can give them some photos for that stuff and make it really good, make them look really cool Mm -hmm. in exchange for free tuition or free six months or a year, every six months, I'll do photos again for them. What what does that take me? A day, two days, three days for to save a couple thousand and it builds that relationship. So again, when somebody comes in and says, Hey, who did those photos CrossFit affiliate in San Mm -hmm. Diego? Oh, well it was Brendan. Oh, cool. Well, I want him to do photos of us too. Like now all of a sudden you're the CrossFit photo, like the CrossFit box photographer. Right. It's great. It's a great gig. (laughs) I feel like you're you're describing my life exactly because (laughs) I haven't been a photographer for many years. I've been in the post-production industry and, um, you know, doing all the post-production work for photographers. So uh, a few years ago, I started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, picked up my camera again, kind of dusted it off from the, uh, it was sitting in the closet, just collecting dust and started bringing it to the gym. And we had, uh, you know, these world-class athletes coming through at the time doing seminars. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I told the owner of the gym, Hey, I'd love to help you with social media. I'd love to, you know, just continue bringing my camera. And, um, I've been super, super fortunate to not have had to pay for my gym membership at all. And I'm not even really a professional photographer. Yes, I do. I do shoot here and there, but uh, you know, it's not how I make my living, but yeah, it's been a great win for me because I love training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, uh, I just bring my camera every time I go snap some shots, maybe take some video and make sure I'm continually posting content. Yeah. So anyway, that's an interesting uh, side conversation that we've had. I I love that conversation about uh, doing free work because there's so many people that are polarized on that. No, I will never do free work. And a lot of people are saying, no, I would would love to do free work because I do enjoy the exposure. And then people, of course, respond with people die from exposure. Ha ha. You know, so there's that whole conversation (laughs) going on online. Yeah. I think that a big thing, like, again, like the key takeaway is to make sure it's the exposure you want. I think taking a hard line either way is so ignorant. Right. Uh, And I think being open to like, I'm smart. I'm a professional. I'm a small business owner. It's not about exposure. It's about a relationship. I'm going to do free work for you and it's going to provide me value back in a way that I want. And if I don't want it, I just say no thanks. As opposed to being like, I never do it for free when like it could mean you know, a a six figure gig down the road or something crazy. Like that'd be ridiculous. Exactly. Love that. Hey, a quick break just to let you know that this show is brought to you by Essential Edit, editing and design for photographers just like you. Yes, Lightroom editing, retouching and album design, all done to your spec, your style, so that you can focus on the essentials of your business. Instead of dreading the edit, spend that time booking more clients, networking with vendors, or spending more time with the people you love. It's super affordable, three to five day turnaround, friendliest service on the planet. And yes, satisfaction is always guaranteed. Let's get you started. Send us some sample images at essentialedit.com. Enjoy the rest of the show. I'm super excited to get into this topic of SEO for photographers um, because I love this game of SEO and uh, I love playing by the rules. Um, and I'll admit to you, Brendan, you you probably looked at the Essential Edit website and, and just laughed at my SEO attempts. I, maybe not. I don't know. But I love <laughs> studying SEO and I love doing everything I can to play by the rules and, you know, up my rankings. Um, but uh, let's just first assume that if somebody tuned into this episode, they understand at least what SEO means. They just hit play on this podcast episode and and they want to learn more about SEO. But let's just kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. Let's define SEO. How would you define it in a nutshell to somebody who's brand new to this concept of SEO? So one of the things that I hate is how like mystical it seems SEO is <laughs> when there's things that are way more confusing than that. Sure. Everybody understands Facebook and Facebook reach and all these things, but do you really understand like what Facebook, how do they measure that? Does a like matter more or a comment or a view or a share or like, where does that matter? Right. What if they embed it in a blog, like your Facebook post in a blog post? Does that mm-hmm. help? Everybody thinks they get Facebook because they use it so much, Mm -hmm. but everybody uses Google a lot. But then that comes to SEO and they're like this. I don't know how to do that. (laughs) It's 
it's so my hope today is to demystify SEO. It is a very basic, very simple, like there's tons of nuances, just like photography. But essentially, like people, it's like when you hand somebody a camera and you're like, hey, can you take a picture? And they look at it. They're like, how do you do it? It's like that button has been in the same spot on every camera since I've been alive. Don't (laughs) act like you don't just because I hand you like a nice DSLR, you don't know how to use it. Like look through the hole, push the button. (laughs) Exactly. Um, It's not a like the basics are not very complicated. It's hard to get good at it. That's why I do it as a profession and people pay me well. Same as if you're a photographer, you know how to use that tool really well. So I would define SEO as this. It's authority. It is telling Google, the number one search engine in the world, and yes, other things matter, Yahoo, Bing, they matter, but Google matters the most. They have like 80 sure. to 100% of the, the search that's out I there. like those stats, 80 to 100%. I mean, <laughs> I like, well, it depends. You're so I don't right, get. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into my new show of like, well, on mobile, they have 99%, but on desktop, they have 85%. Like, totally. that just confuses yeah. it more. So they have, I mean, think about it. The word Google means search. Nobody is like... I know. Yeah. Hey, man. Uh, yeah, I just binged it and it said this. <laughs> People would be like, what's wrong with you? So like, You must be a really diehard Windows Microsoft guy if you're using that yeah. phrase. <laughs> Nobody bings any. Like, I feel like that's like a Seinfeld episode or something. Totally, just, totally. You know, so uh, it's authority. It's okay. telling Google I'm an authority on this topic. And there's three ways that we do that. Uh, I use the analogy of build, you know, building a house to sell it. In order to build a house to sell it, I need three things. I need a a great foundation. I need a great frame for the home uh, that outlines like all the parts of it and everything. And then I need everything else that goes on it. Yeah. Uh, I need the siding. I need the cupboards. I need, you know, all ever the paint, like everything that goes in the home on top of that frame. And the way that works in SEO in terms of authority is my foundation is my website's performance, how fast it is, how well, people can use it. Then I have uh, on-page SEO. That's kind of like the frame of my house. Mm-hmm. People are confused about what on-page SEO means. Like, if you know what all three of those words mean in isolation, you know what on-page SEO is. It's literally <laughs> like the things on your website that tell you tell Google what my website is about and how authoritative I am. Yeah. And then the things that really sell a home are not the, wow, man, this house just... I think it's got a really great foundation. Like that doesn't sell the house. What sells the house is the siding and the windows and the roof and like all of that stuff. So that that's the off page SEO. That's the thing that really gets you ranking and traffic from Google and off page SEO is just everything from the rest of the internet that tells Google that you're an authority. So that's primarily comes in the form of links. Mm. So my website's performance the things on my website that tell Google what it's about and how authoritative I am. And then the things around the rest of the internet that tell Google, Hey, this is a really good website for this. Okay, topic. cool. Perfect. So uh, obviously SEO is for anyone and everyone with a website, but are there unique challenges for a photographer having their website uh, completely optimized? Yeah, definitely. I think photography just by nature of the, uh, art and science of it is that it's images. And Mm -hmm. I, while I believe that Google's going to figure this out, like right now, Google doesn't read images. Like they can't automatically just tell what an image is. Mm -hmm. I think within the next four or five years, they're going to look at a website and they're going to be like, Oh, this website's about uh, wedding photography in Mexico. Cause I looked at that picture and because I have machine learning, uh, I can tell that that's uh, Cancun and I can tell that that's a wedding dress. Mm. And I can tell that there's a bunch of people in the background that must be a wedding in Cancun. That must be what this website's about. But right now it isn't. So I have sure. to use words to tell Google right. what that's about. So photographers love to put a billion pictures on their websites. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a terrible idea. If somebody like, think about it, (laughs) it's never like the 31st picture that gets somebody to hire you. Yeah. Like if they can't tell in five (laughs) pictures that you're the person, you don't need 30. That just slows your website down and it's a mistake because then they try to load it on their phone and they don't have a good connection where they're at in the you know, they're in downtown Chicago and the buildings are messing it up and they're going to load your on their phone and they can't find it Mm -hmm. or it's not loading quick enough. And they're like, screw this. I'm going to go look at somebody else's website. So that's a huge mistake. And it's definitely a consideration is that most photographers don't use enough words to explain what they do. 
Interesting. Cool. Okay. That's uh, well said. Now, where do photographers start? Okay. Let's say that there's a brand new photographer listening and they've just kind of gotten their first WordPress site set up and they haven't really given any thought to SEO. What would be their first step? So they have, I would argue they have given thought to SEO because they're using WordPress. Clever. Um, You know, I think that a lot of people use Squarespace and Wix and Zenfolio and yeah, what a smug mug and like all of these things as their website. And that's hosting it somewhere else Mm -hmm. is the same. Well, not hosting it somewhere else, but building it on somebody else's platform is the same as trying to use Facebook for your website. Ooh, interesting. They it's their playground. It's their sandbox. They make the rules. And when they change things, you don't get a say in it. However, with WordPress, you do. Additionally, there's a reason that I think like 25, I don't even know what the percentage is, but a large amount of the internet is WordPress websites. Yeah. And the reason is it's very good, not just from a content kind of point of view, but it's also really good for search. It sends the the smartest signals to Google as far as like what these things are. Mm -hmm. So I actually was surveying, uh, I'm working on a really good blog post about Zenfolio versus SmugMug versus like WordPress. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be some stuff about Squarespace and Wix in there. And people use all these other platforms because they think it's easy and it's pretty. Right. Pretty only matters. Like if you have seven people coming to your website every month, I don't care if it's the prettiest thing in the world. It's not doing anything. Right. So I would rather have an ugly website that 2000 people come to every month where they can see some photos, but the navigation doesn't look great. And it isn't like have that. What is it like parallax kind of thing that Squarespace always has. Mm -hmm. Those things don't matter. What matters is getting eyeballs on your photos so you can Mm -hmm. book more clients. Uh, You're running a business. So I would say that such a long answer to such an easy question, but (laughs) I would say starting with WordPress is the biggest hurdle. Photographers notoriously give each other terrible advice (laughs) about like, it's like, I, you know, you, I've asked in a bunch of Facebook groups and things like that and a bunch of other places, just like, what are you using? And people are like, no, it's Squarespace. It's all about the Squarespace. And I'm like, yeah. okay, so from a business background, not a photographer, because that's, I've never claimed to be a, a photographer. I am, as much as you're humble about your photography skills, I'm terrible. Like, I'm a bad <laughs> photographer. I love it. I'm passionate about it, but I'm not good. I'm not trying to get better at photography. I'm trying to get better at business yeah. and serving my clients. So like that doesn't necessarily serve me well. Uh, I guess my point is that like I, I have a business background, so I'm giving really good advice from a business standpoint, but photographers notoriously are like, yeah, use Wix. And I'm like, oh. why? Well, you know, it's easy. Well, mm. typically the easiest thing is easy for a reason. They built in right. shortcuts And the problem is when Google goes to look at that page and they see all those shortcuts and they see missing information or wrong information, it's like, oh, this isn't the right thing for this topic. These aren't, this is not the best wedding, most authoritative wedding photographer in the city of Chicago. Like there's a reason that when you go to the top Google searches for every wedding photographer, portrait, newborn, all of those websites are WordPress. Yeah. That's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. So I think starting with WordPress is a huge hurdle but it's an absolute must if you're serious about your business. You're just going to end up switching to WordPress later anyways. Why not just do it right, right. now? Right. I guess I've always felt like using Squarespace or Wix or uh, Format is another one that's out there that's beautiful. But, uh, you know, the, the hesitation with that is just that at any moment they could pull the rug out from underneath you. Uh, that company could you know, have a a massive failure, they could go out of business and you've put all your eggs in their basket and Mm -hmm. then they take that basket and it's gone completely. So I know the Squarespace is in a great place and, you know, profitable business and all that stuff. But, you know, that's, that's always been one of the, the, the fears for me in building a website based on someone else's platform is that at any moment they could change, not just, you know, whatever the rules of SEO are, but it could be the whole format that, um, either makes your website unusable or, you know, they have some, uh, downtime or whatever. And so, you know, I guess that's always kind of been my, my thing. Yes. I understand like for sure they're, they're nice to use. I used format for my kind of Per, uh, photographer persona, <laughs> that little photographer persona, persona <laughs> that I have out there. Um, I used format just because simply people kept asking me, do you have a website? And I know enough about 
WordPress to be dangerous. Um, but it was, I knew it was too big of a project for me to just take on, um, to put together a silly little website just to show some of my, uh, corporate headshots. So I put together a quick website on format and I think I did it in like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. Um, so I used format, but I felt really weird and strange about it, to be honest, because I kind of felt like, you know, this is a real small looking company. It still says powered by format on the bottom. Um, didn't really like that I was advertising for them, even though I was paying them monthly. Uh, so yeah, there's, it's easy, but there are trade-offs. There are lots of trade-offs in the process. Definitely. I think it's one of those things where if you don't know better, uh, it can be kind of hard, but if you do know better, like you should just make, and it's not that hard to, you know, if you just go to simply go to Bluehost or HostGator and when you sign up, you know, you set up your hosting, it's pretty easy hit the chat button on their websites. They'll walk you through it. Mm-hmm. And most of them have a one click WordPress installation. Just do that. It takes, I mean, I, my buddy, uh, Pat set up a WordPress website on a new domain. I think it's in like under two minutes. So everybody who complains that it's really, he's got a video on YouTube. That's pretty awesome. And he made like a post on it in under two minutes. Like you can do it. It's not a time thing. It's just, uh, you feel like this is hard. So you don't want to, um, well, Brendan, and the thing the is drag and drop. It's so beautiful. It's so easy. <laughs> just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, man. I, and I'm not saying this from a place of ignorance either. Like, well, have you ever tried? Yes, I sure. have. Like I built my mom's, uh, my mom had a nonprofit that she was extremely passionate about for a long yeah. time. And we tried to build a Squarespace website and it was for assisting refugees in the city she lived in. So wow. very specific niche. Yeah. And no matter what we couldn't get, like I, I had to drive a lot of links to it just to get it to rank because it was sending such confusing signals. And this is in like, I'm trying to not use jargon here. Cause again, like I don't think it needs to be mystified, but like the title tags, the descriptions, everything was messed up that it was sending Google. It wasn't very clear what her website was about. So it was very hard to get it to show up for what it needed to show up for. And that was, right. if we did that on WordPress, there was nobody, there's no other refugee assistance, mm-hmm. uh, nonprofits in her town. Like yeah. there was no competition for that search. So she should have been there right away. And that yeah. was kind of indicative of what I see for a lot of photographers using Squarespace. It's really beautiful, but they can't get it to show up for anything in Google, which means they're not getting that automatic pipeline of leads and clients every month. That's just so crazy to me that somebody could be paying for a Squarespace um, site or a format site or Wix site. They could be paying decent money for that every month and they're still getting zero rankings. That's really sad. It's a bummer. Um, you know what they do? You know why they do it, though, uh, to be honest? And I, again, this is just from my experience, is a lot of photographers get caught up making websites for other photographers, not for their clients. Mm-hmm. So it's for the approval of my peers Right. Not for the people who are actually paying me. Yeah. So I think that's a big concern. Like, who, who is this website actually for? Which is a huge, um, which is a huge thing in our industry. Honestly, I see that uh, translates to social media as well. Um, what I've noticed on Instagram and Facebook is that a lot of photographers have, they may have a lot of followers, but a lot of those followers, and I wish I could find the stats on this, but um, a little hard to figure out, but it seems like most of their followers, or at least the most of the interactions that they have in the comments and in the likes is that those are photographers as well. So uh, in our industry, it seems that every photographer is connected to each other and everyone's watching what everyone's doing. And there are a few photographers that I see that are doing really, really well on social media and actually booking clients and finding leads in their comments. Uh, I talk about one of my buddies, Rich Lander, uh, often to people. And I point to him as a guy who's doing social media well. His social media, like if you look at his Instagram, he's literally talking with prospective clients in the comments. It's amazing. And I think that's really how it should be. I think it's great to have the camaraderie and the the community of other photographers to come around you and tell you you're doing great work and whatever. But um, I I almost feel like in our industry, there's just this, uh, everybody's watching each other to see what the other person's doing. And there aren't necessarily a lot of people who are just simply leading and saying, this is what I'm going to do. I don't care what my peers think. I don't care what everyone else is doing. I'm just going to do this. Absolutely. Like if I wanted to learn how to use my camera better, I wouldn't go ask another business expert 
who mm-hmm. also takes pictures. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't go ask uh, my buddy, Justin Jackson, uh, what, you know, how, how do you know, we both make videos. Like, how can I make my videos better? No, I would go to a video guy. Sure. I would go to a photographer to use. But the funny thing is a lot of photographers and I, again, like nothing negative. This happens in every industry. We go to our peers mm-hmm. instead of the subject matter experts. Mm-hmm. So I would make sure that I went, if I wanted to learn how to do social media better, I wouldn't ask my photographer friends. I would ask social media experts. Sure. I would go join those Facebook groups where social media managers hang out and see what they're doing that's working. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you get caught up in this kind of echo chamber of like, oh, please, like, let's all like each other's Instagram. I see this a lot. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of photographers like each other's Instagrams. They like each other's pictures, thinking that increases the reach for hashtags and stuff like that. But if you ask any of those photographers, they're all doing it. It takes time and, and effort and headspace to do it. Mm-hmm. And you ask all of them, how many clients have you booked from that? Well, zero. But it yeah. works. Well, right. it works because you say it works, not because you have proven it. Like nobody, it's not actually working for any of you. So <laughs> I like to see people like it's, there's a really famous book called The E-Myth uh, about like, book. yeah, how and I think every photographer should read it. It's amazing. It is classic. It's in like the canon of business books. Mm -hmm. And it's just this idea of like we focus too much on these vanity metrics and these other things. We don't focus on actually making money. And like you have to like do the the profit producing activities. You have to be in your business uh, and then scale that out to work on your business. Not necessarily. And this is where we talk about like hiring for somebody for SEO, hiring somebody to do social media. Like eventually you'll get to that point. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you need to make sure those are profit producing activities. Sure. So you wrote an amazing um, how to on uh, your blog, seven need to know photography SEO tips. And you make a really compelling case for why somebody should hire an SEO specialist. Um, So Let's run through that. Why should a photographer hire a specialist and not tackle it themselves? Oh, I didn't pull any punches with that, did I? I uh, so, so this post, <laughs> I on, love it. Uh, yeah, on on my website, the uh, the post just says like, I let's be like super clear. I want you as a client. Yes, and like that's the first line, and the reason is that. I know that photographers, and this is based on my work with photographers, not me just trying to like, those are my clients. I know they don't have time to work on it. And the thing is, it's like, well, I don't want to hire anybody because I, you know, a lot of excuses. Um, right. And it's like, well, okay, then do it. Like, I'm going to give you all the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you everything I know. If you execute on it and you make a great business and you get a bunch of business from it, then I win. And mm-hmm. if you can't execute on it and you want to hire me, then I win. So the thing is, like, a lot, sometimes photographers are afraid of, like, if I make content that teaches people how to take their own pictures better, uh, are are they not going to hire me? Well, if that's the case, then those weren't your clients to begin with. They were sure. never going to hire you. There's nobody who was like, oh, I was just about to hire him. And then he taught me how to do it. And I did it myself. Like, they, they the issue is time. We have a very finite amount of time. Uh, and SEO, like anything like any marketing to do right takes time Um, because I've built out a system and a way of doing it that I can do it at scale. It takes me less time to serve you than it would for you to learn it and less time, even if once you have the same level of expertise as me to do it for yourself, because you're also trying to run a photography business. Right. Well, and that's interesting because that comes in, (laughs) that's the same exact situation that I run into with doing post-production for photographers. What I find is that our clients are the ones who are struggling the most with their post-production. They're maybe four or five or seven weddings behind. I've literally had photographers call and say, I'm so far behind. I can't see, you know, at the end in sight, can you just take these seven weddings and, and do them for me. Just get them off my, off my desk, please. Um, and really the thing is for most photographers, you're right. They have a lot of other things going on. Um, they're answering emails, they're following up with, uh, warm leads and, um, you know, trying to book more, um, consultations are working with vendors, you know, they're doing their hustle. 
it's rare for a photographer to have the luxury of learning post-production and spending six or seven hours a day, five days a week doing post-production. And so they may have a slow season where they don't even launch Lightroom for a few weeks at a time because they just, they're doing other things and they're not in that post-production mode. So they get to the season and they feel like their skills are lacking and they just don't have what it takes. And so that's when they usually call us for a lifeline. Um, in the same way with SEO, right? Not every photographer has the luxury of sitting down and reading, um, you know, 10,000 word articles on how to do SEO <laughs> and taking, you know, online courses and stuff like that. And so it, it makes sense, right? To hire somebody who has that skill as their greatest strength. So for us, we do post-production. We do post-production every day and our people do more. Our people, this is a funny thing. Like our editors, most of my editors can process more weddings in one week than most photographers shoot in an entire year. And so for you doing SEO, right? Like for you, you get in and you're out, you're done. You know exactly what you're doing and it's super clean, super simple. And you know, you've got it taken care of. Whereas a photographer, their, their time is much better spent doing the things that make their business money. Correct. Definitely. It's kind of the, uh, the thing, the, the analogy I like to give is we, we hire professionals all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like we hire, we will. So I'll give you two examples. We hire professionals. We also hire things all the mm -hmm. time. Uh, for example, uh, I hire every single Sunday, I hire my lawnmower to mow my lawn. And <laughs> yep. I mean like the physical lawnmower, I, I pay it. I, I pay for gas. I pay for upkeep. I bought it. Uh, I do that instead of going out and swinging like the crazy, like old things that people used to do to mow their lawns or doing one of those manual push ones with the cycling blades. Like it's easier. So it's worth the money for me to do that. I pay somebody to change my oil. I know how to change the oil in my car. I can yes. do it myself. Mm -hmm. Just don't have time. And while I'm there and they're changing my oil, I can be on my laptop on Wi-Fi working and it, it makes more sense. But for some reason, with some things, the problem is, and this is why I want to demystify SEO, like when you don't understand it, you're not sure why you would pay somebody like me uh, 500 or or $1,000 a month to do it for you because you don't right. understand how it works and you don't understand the value. The thing is, like, you know, you let's say you're a wedding photographer, you make $3,000 per wedding. Uh, that's how much you charge to do it, to, to shoot a wedding. And I'm able to bring you, I, let's say you pay me a thousand dollars a month. If I'm able to bring you one new client every three months, which is so small, mm -hmm. like if I'm, then you break even the break even point is so small, but people see that like upfront money of like, Oh, hiring a social media manager, hiring an SEO expert, like that's so much money and it kind of freaks them out. So they back off and then they get paralyzed and do nothing. Right. I would rather you hire an expert, check the, and that's one of the big things I talked about in that article is like monitor the ROI. Don't trust them that they're doing something because there's a lot of sketch balls out there that I mm -hmm. have ended up replacing. People see what I do and they're like, oh, that's not what my current guy does or girl. Like it's not what my current sure. SEO person does. Uh, I need you to take over. Can you do that? And it's like, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And I fix any damage or just if what they were doing wasn't working, mine starts to work. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of the, the big thing. So we hire p things and people all the time, uh, experts in their area without even a second thought. But in areas like this and in our business, sometimes we're nervous. We have bootstrapped, especially photographers, you've bootstrapped. And by that, I mean, you've done it yourself for everything. You've worn right. all of the hats for so long that you're not, you're not comfortable not wearing one of those hats anymore. Right. Totally. And then once you get one of those hats off, like uh, I'm working with uh, about to start working with a client right now who was like, I just hired somebody for this, 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 that they have like, I was like, you're building a team. You're like mm. a real entrepreneur of like, you're building out a big, giant, scalable business. Like this is fun to work with people like that. Yeah. But I think you have to get comfortable and maybe it starts small, right? Where you just hire somebody for something that you can track that'll give you an ROI uh, and then over time you just kind of ease into that, but just be willing to take one of those hats off for a little bit and let somebody else work in your business with you so you can work on it. Love it. So how much patience should people have when it comes to their SEO? Um, let's say they hire somebody like you to make some changes. How swiftly are they going to see the results? And then what issues could arise if somebody's doing it by themselves? What issues could arise from maybe switching directions too often? 
So that's a great question. Uh, to answer your first part, uh, SEO takes time. That's why I don't sell SEO. Um, I sell leads and I sell clients Mm -hmm. and I sell traffic. Um, my goal is to build up the organic Google search traffic of your website over time. That could take, depending on your, it depends on your competition. The, uh, joke my buddy always tells is it's not about being faster than the bear. It's just about being faster than the guy next to you. Exactly. Um, it's terrible. (laughs) Bears eating people is not how you sell services, but you know, the thing is, it's really depends on your competition. If everybody else in your local area that does newborn photography is, has terrible websites and no backlinks, then you, you don't have to do that much work. Right. Whereas if you are uh, a high end wedding photographer in New York City, then or Atlanta or something like that, like that's going to be a lot harder and a lot more work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, 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 it kind of starts there. Uh, what was your question? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was your question again? Yeah, sorry. It was kind of a, a two, two layered question. Sorry about that. So basically, um, how quick are they going to see results? You, you've answered that saying it's going to take some time. And then I'm thinking specifically about the person who, who is determined to do it themselves and really, you know, read your guide and read every guide there is out there. Um, what if they kind of change course too often? If they kind of tweak this knob and this dial and push this button, uh, are there negative effects of playing with your SEO too much. Cool. So I think in terms of time, uh, one of the things I do to mitigate that is I run ads. I'm really good at pay-per-click on Instagram, Facebook, and Google. And uh, I see a lot of dividends. So if I can get you, let's say you hire me, like it might take six months to sell SEO or to, you know, to see that SEO work. Mm-hmm. Uh, really well and pay dividends. And we track all of that. That's what I love about SEO is we can track everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, I've brought in 10 clients. So I've brought, brought in $30,000 worth of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've paid for my own services for the next two years already. Right. So you, you, ha- you can be a little more patient when you're getting that, that money coming in. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a smart thing to do. Uh, I think all it's kind of just like how photographers do who book for weddings also will do engagement shoots, right? Sure. Saying, Hey, I'm going to pay me, put it down, put money down. And in a year, I'm going to give you something great. Like that's not, that's a terrible sales cycle. <laughs> What's better is to say like, Hey, I'm going to be in touch. We're going to do an engagement shoot. And then that's interactions. And then you deliver those photos and that's interactions. And mm-hmm. maybe they buy whatever else you sell. And then that's interaction. Oh, here's the wedding. Now this blah, blah, blah. So it kind of shortens that sales cycle down and provides more value along with the package. So I do that to kind of mitigate it. Mm-hmm. Cool. Now, uh, on top of that, if somebody was determined to do it on their own, there's enough information out there that you can do it on your own. I think finding somebody, uh, and maybe we can put some of these in the show notes, somebody that you trust. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, I think I'm the best resource for SEO for photographers. Mm-hmm. But in in lieu of me doing it, I wouldn't look at other SEO for photographer websites or anything like that. I would just look at SEO websites. Uh, the best person I found for SEO is a guy named Ryan Stewart. He runs an agency, an SEO agency out of Miami, Florida. His website is Weberis, W-E-B-R-I-S dot org. And he's the best for SEO. He's also funny and snarky and passionate, kind of like me. Um, <laughs> so he's a lot of fun. He's got some great YouTube videos. He's just, he's ridiculous. Got a lot of tattoos. He'll, he'll curse and stuff. He's great. So I think he's a great resource as well. If you're determined to learn it, uh, learn it from somebody smart who's willing to give you, uh, let you see behind the curtain and not tell you vague things. Right. Uh, the other thing is that changing direction uh, doesn't really matter. I think as long as you're doing the right things, uh, you know, changing focus and stuff like that is, is okay. You okay. can kind of hodgepodge it for a little bit, um, but it's not a make or break. I think... W- Maybe you can give me a little bit more clarity on what you mean by change direction. Oh, well, let's say let's like just, I'm going to blog now and then I'm going to do something else and then I'll do this tomorrow or. Well, it's just there. There are some strategies that I've seen where people are saying you've got to create content, um, you know, as, as often as possible. And then so I could see somebody being like, well, I'm going to always push out like, oh, you know, Chicago's best family photographer, Chicago's best family photographer, versions of that key phrase or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and then they're like, you know, what? I, you know what, I want to be a headshot photographer. I want to do headshots as well. So I'm mm. also going to like jam in some headshot blog posts and, you know, now I'm going to do headshot photography in Chicago or something. And so, I don't know, I guess it's like, is it is it negative? I guess my question is, 
is it negative if you try too many different key phrases, keywords uh, along the way? So that's a great question. Uh, I think that changing your focus of your business isn't bad. I think Google and search and humans are smart enough to know that if you do headshots, you could also do weddings. Right. Uh, Those are different, right? I'm not trying to just like, I understand that from a business perspective and from a skill perspective that specializing on one of those, like is a little bit different than being a generalist and being a little bit kind of okay at everything. I know that Mm -hmm. those require different skill sets. But I think that people can understand that, like, generally speaking, if you are a beast of a wedding photographer, you could probably take some pretty dope headshots, right? Yeah. Like, I get that. Totally. So um, I don't think that matters as much. Here's one thing you said that I do really want to address because I'm super passionate about it mm-hmm. is uh, we call this like bloat on a site <laughs> of like I have 700 blog posts. They're each short and thin and kind of garbage, and they don't really address anything specific. It's just me talking. Right. People think more content is better. And this is a big thing that in my own industry, I really hate. Some people, some agencies sell a uh, footprint, meaning like, oh, look, you know, essential edit ranked for 100 keywords last month, and this month they rank for 120, and next month they rank for 140. Mm -hmm. The problem is that that's a vanity metric. Right. If that's not also increasing your traffic, that doesn't help. And if that increased traffic doesn't increase your leads and those leads don't increase your sales, we're not actually doing anything. We're just playing SEO. Mm -hmm. So I would advise photographers. uh, I have a really great article over on Photography Spark. Uh, about like a blog post formula for photographers. I think every time you take pictures, you should blog about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that formula is kind of like the type of photography you did, the location you did it in. And then in the article, you're talking about, here's my relationship with my clients. Here's the work that I did. Uh, Here's something that went wrong during the shoot. Something always goes wrong. Yeah. And I think that positions you as an expert to say, like, it started raining. The light in there was bad, blah, blah, blah. Tell them what was wrong and tell them how you handled it. It gives them confidence. Like, if I were to hire you for your service, like, even if something goes wrong, you're a pro, you can handle it. Yeah. And then five or ten pictures at the end. Yeah. And that's it. And put a lot of words, like, Google reads words, people read words. So you need to have a lot of story in there, less Mm -hmm. pictures, more words. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that that kind of formula, if you're determined to do this for yourself, really sets you up for a lot of success. But continuing to write for your peers Mm -hmm. or write about gear, no clients give a crap whether you use a Sony or a Nikon or a Canon. Only other photographers care about that. If you look at Photo MBA, there is nothing on that website that talks about digital marketing agencies. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on there that talks about the SEO industry. Everything is a hundred percent focused on what my clients want to know or potential clients want to know and what would help photographers in their business. So everything on your website should address your work and then topics that'll help your clients. So if you do newborn photography, you should have content, really good content, high quality content. Don't even publish it if it's not high quality. I know that's terrible. Like sometimes done is better than perfect, Mm -hmm. but it should be somewhere in that like 80 to 90% perfect range. Um, And then everything else other than your work should be things that help people who book you. People who are parents of newborns, probably moms, Mm -hmm. I would say are more likely to book a newborn photographer than a dad. At least that was the case in my family. For sure. And I I would just make content that brings in, you know, moms of newborns. And then they're like, oh, I need these photos. Like, that would be cool to have photos. Oh, who took that photo in this article about like my baby's not sleeping? I know that sounds silly, but like if you're dedicated to that um, and you're dedicated to weddings, like have articles in there about, you know, the 10 best places to get married in Chicago that people don't know about that are Mm -hmm. just going to provide immense value to those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, on top of, you know, to get them to build that trust and that relationship that then allows them to hire you and become a client. 
Cool. That's good. You know, um, t- touching on that topic of, you know, writing about everything that you shoot uh, as a photographer, there's a lot of talk online about long form content. Uh, I think I t- first learned the phrase from Tim Ferriss, who talked about his blog posts being no less than something crazy, like 2000 words or something. Uh, what do you think about long form content for photographers? Describe this method, maybe just a little bit, and then tell me uh, if you subscribe to this method. So I think anybody who checks out uh, photomba.net and sees the first post is mm-hmm. 6,500 words. Mm-hmm. It took me a couple of weeks to write it and make yeah. it really good with images and video and stuff. Like it's, th- it's 6,500 words, right? Like I want to make sure it's the best piece of content possible. When I write about, uh, I'm in Chicago, so this is a local example, but like if I'm going to write about a wedding at Navy Pier, I want it to be the best possible piece of content on the internet about Mm. having a wedding at Navy Pier, not 200 words, not 400 words. If you're writing the definitive piece of content on that and people are like, but I don't have time for that. Um, Either, I mean, you either have time or money. If you don't have both, then you're not running a business. Or if you don't have either of those, you're not running a business. You're just playing, right? Mm -hmm. So you're either making the time to do it or you're getting the money to do it. Like hire somebody to help you with that or help you figure that out or build a system and hold yourself accountable. Join a mastermind group that can like with other photographers where like we're all going to help each other in our business, hold each other accountable. There's a lot of ways to get past this stuff. Um, So I think like creating that definitive piece of content and obviously Google reads words. So nonsense words are not helpful, but in the Tim Ferriss is a perfect example. Like 2000 words is not crazy. That's like a minimum for me. Uh, That's what I want. Now, obviously, like I've written a lot of blog posts for clients and help them with their blog posts. I understand that 400 words might be a lot for an engagement shoot or a (laughs) wedding. Like that's unless something really cool happened, like you, you, you're not going to have that many words. Sure. But, you know, you just, again, need to do better than the people next to you. Right. So I think that long form content really, really matters telling a story really like you tell stories in images. You also have to tell stories in those words. Um, And it's could just be as simple as talking about the images that you took. Like this is a photograph of this and this is what was going on there. And this was a funny story, you know, Oh, this is a zany picture at the end of like the groom doing a handstand. Like, did you got, did you know that he was on the like America, like the U S Olympic gymnastics team, like things like that are really helpful just to build that content out. I think long form is the way to go right now until we get to the point where Google can just look at pictures and tell a story to certain like people who are searching based on images. Yeah. Uh, You know, but again, like I, well, I think that's happening in five years. Like maybe don't hold your breath. Maybe we're going to make self (laughs) self driving cars first. I don't know. Yeah, totally. You know, what's interesting. This reminds me of an episode that I had just a few weeks ago um, with a photographer named Emily Gutman. Um, She shoots city hall weddings in San Francisco. And our conversation was purely about just, you know, shooting city hall weddings. And uh, my question to her was, how did you get into it? And she just laughed. And she said, I stumbled into it. I literally just made a blog post about shooting city hall weddings. And, um, it was actually a resource. It became more of a resource for the potential bride and groom about how to get married at city hall in San Francisco. And so she phased out completely her traditional weekend weddings and solely shoots city hall weddings during the week now. And that became, uh, her, that became her niche. Her business is shooting city hall weddings because of that one blog post. That one blog post became her how to get married. Here's the person you need to see in this office. You need to go get this form. And, uh, it was, um, you know, designed for the person who's thinking about getting married at city hall. And guess what? All of her clients are now city hall wedding, uh, people or couples that are getting married at City Hall. Um, so that's a perfect illustration of, you know, some long form content. It speaks to the person who is going to be your client and it's beneficial. It's actual content that these people want uh, to read and consume on their own. Definitely. I think trying to reverse engineer your client and think like they're booking a photographer, but what else are they looking for online is so helpful. I, I think City Hall in San Francisco, just knowing 
the industry the way that I do, like pretty intimately, is a very unique thing just because like it is a very it's not like a niche location like City Hall, San Francisco. If anybody like wants to Google that, if you're not a photographer from that area or you're just listening to this because you're getting into photography, Google City Hall, San Francisco. It's ridiculous. It's it's such an amazing building and some of the stuff that goes on there. It's incredible. So you're like, wait, aren't like, shouldn't you not get married in city hall? Isn't that like where you just go see the clerk and they give you the papers? It's like, <laughs> no, no, no. San Francisco city hall is a totally different world. So, exactly. Yeah. Niching down to that. And that's not going to go away. Right. Like right. that guide, the more she like, you know, maybe she writes content for other websites, mm-hmm. uh, on other photography websites, other San Francisco local websites, and then links to her own guide and mm-hmm. continues to build that authority in Google. So now anybody who's getting married is going to, you know, like how to get married in city hall in San Francisco, they're going to find that guide. Oh, look at all these great pictures that are here in this guide. Who took mm-hmm. these? Oh, this is a photographer. I should hire her. Exactly. It just makes sense. Exactly. Now here's a question for you. Let's say Emily had some new information about getting married at city hall and wanted to update that blog post. Is it better for her to update that one blog post or is it better for her to create uh, another blog post and link also to the previous one what would be the best strategy i would say update your content always the more you can make that more it's like should i um sometimes writing a second book but like if you write two books on the exact same topic people are like which one which one is for me and google wonders the same like which one of these do you want me to put here because they're both about the same thing Mm. whereas if you were to like you know write a book and then five years later put out a second edition like that i think tim ferris is again a great example of he wrote the four-hour work week and then he updated it and that second edition is what got me into business Mm. like i read that later updated one yeah uh it's versus him writing like another like book about business that wasn't the it would have been very confusing of like what do i which one should i choose sure so i would say update that content and build out that authority even more okay cool all really good uh conversation on seo there's one last question i kind of want to wrap up with and and that is this theme that um i see a lot in our industry is that and that's that photographers come to us uh and and look they're looking for help with their post-production and uh they have a lot of potential i hear you know so much optimism in their voice and they're really excited about being the next best photographer in their industry or in their in their market in their city and um you know they're they've got the fire they're gonna they're gonna burn bright they're gonna you know break through the stratosphere and then unfortunately i noticed that a lot of photographers kind of disappear after a couple of years um why do you think that why do you think that happens why do photographers burn out so quickly what can they do to uh, prevent that from happening yeah it's a great question i don't think it's unique just to photographers. However, uh, I think it happens in everything. You and I love jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get the blue belt curse. People get that first big belt promotion. They get their blue belt and then they never come back. Mm. I don't know. It, it happens. Um, yeah. I think it happens in every single, you know, people start uh, digital marketing agencies and they get their first couple clients and it goes good. And then they, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to do it anymore. So I think it's two things. Number one, I'm okay with quitting. I don't like like the rah, rah, do it, you know, go at it hard forever. Um, I think understand what, like talk to a veteran photographer, understand what the work people like the art of photography, but they don't understand what goes into running a photography business. Right. You have the audacity like I do to say, I want to make an independent living in a world that wants us to work for somebody else. I'm going to buck the system I'm going to make an independent living doing art and I'm going to, with as much reluctance as I have also learn the business because that's what allows me to do the art. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people are like, Oh, I don't like like the day, you know, people say like being a lawyer, uh, little kids get told, be a lawyer. You like to argue. And I'm like being a lawyer (laughs) sitting in a, it's sitting in a room reading a thousand articles and then writing a hundred thousand words. Yes. It's not arguing. It's not fun. If you don't like reading and writing, don't become a lawyer. Have fun. Let photography be your hobby. Protect your passion. I made a business out of jujitsu and it made me hate it. I think that's a terrible idea and it's terrible advice to like make up your passion, your business all the time. I think if you're not passionate about business, you shouldn't run a business in any facet. Uh, One of the ways to get around that is hiring people 
or learning it yourself or finding ways to become passionate about the business side of things. But I think it's okay to quit um, and, and pivot into something else. There's no shame in that. Yeah. Uh, I think living a happier life and like we have, uh, I have a tattoo on the inside of my left forearm that faces me because it's just a reminder to myself that says memento mori. And it means like, remember that one day you'll die. And it, it, it sounds morbid, but it's very like carpe diem, uh, YOLO, if you, if you will. <laughs> um, and like, it just reminds me that I have, I have one shot at this. I have one at bat mm-hmm. and like, I need to make the most of it. Uh, it's when, like I stayed up until like one thirty last night in the morning doing work because I've fallen in like I'm in love with the work of this. Yeah. Getting clients is amazing. Seeing that money come in from clients is way more amazing. I love that stuff. But what allows that to happen is what I do in those like non, you know, it's not sexy. It's work. It's editing. It's the, the things that you get hired for, like that you you personally get hired for, right? Like yeah. it's that edit that you don't want to do. It's that 500th wedding that you photograph that you're like, man, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Or even like that 20th wedding where you're like, I don't know if I really want to do this. Like that's okay if you don't want to do it anymore. But I think the the thing that hurts people the most is going into it with the illusion that this is not going to be work. And it's mm. not going to be hard and it, you're not going to have to do, oh, I'm going to run my own business. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Really? You, <laughs> you don't like you're going to have to do your own books. Have you ever done yeah. accounting before? It's terrible. <laughs> and like if you're not wired for that, like those things can be hard and you either learn to do it yourself and just take it as like this is the cost of having the audacity to not have to do a nine to five in a cubicle with fluorescent lighting that I hate and want to kill myself. And like, just say that and say like, I'm willing to pay this price Mm -hmm. uh, versus that price. Or like you just get the nine to five and that's fine too. Or you do both because it makes you happy and maybe shooting 50 weddings a year doesn't make you happy, but maybe shooting five does. There we go. So just find your balance. Yeah. Beautiful. Brennan, awesome conversation and really, really good advice, man. Thank you so much for being with me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Feel like we could talk for another hour, but uh, I'll let you go this time and um, we'll wrap out in another time in the future, man. But thank you so much for all your insight and, and all your advice. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy to be on here and chat. I hope I've kind of been able to demystify SEO a little bit and let people understand like, it's any skill. It's just like photography. You can learn it. You can get good at it. And I, you know, what would really be a huge win for me is if somewhere down the road, somebody got in touch with you or even me, um, and just said like, Hey, I I heard you say this. I, I took action on it. I did it. It made a tangible impact in my business that allowed me to put food on the table for my kids and, you know, pay for my wife and I to go on a vacation to the Rocky Mountain, like, I don't know, whatever it is in your life, like that would really mean a lot to me. So if anything we've kind of talked about today does make an impact for you, just like, just let one of us know uh, that I think that would be awesome. I hope this has been super helpful. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation off air and maybe figuring out how some ways that I can better my SEO. I know I could (laughs) definitely use some help. So thanks so much, man. I appreciate the conversation and your time today. Thanks. Take care.